I feel like I'm on the radio. Yeah, and I know I'm what you mean. Like doing like a radio interview. Yeah, either that or I feel like it's cool, I feel like you're on stage or something, and then I'm the guy in the in the back, like telling you what to say. <laughs> I'm on like a date, and you're giving yeah. me all the the code words. I'm on a date with a girl, and she's really into SoundCloud rap, <laughs> and I'm like, Charlie, help help a brother out. <laughs> One, two, three. Hi guys, welcome to another Thread Talk with me, Elliot, and I've got Charlie here with me. I've also got him on a screen over here, and we're talking to each other via headphones, recording ourselves separately. We're having to cobble together as something in, in replacement of our normal sort of studio setup. So we're kind of just freestyling it a little bit here. Yeah? It's going to be an art, isn't it, getting this video right? Yes. But we can make we got, it work. We got all day. I believe we got all day. So what are we doing the thread talk on, Charlie? <laughs> And we're just going to talk today about the DIY generation and the SoundCloud era of rap music, which has kind of really permeated the mainstream in the last five years. And we think it's a result of online DIY do-it-yourself mentality to pop culture in general. Charlie has been very slowly uh, through my tenure at Thread re-educating me on, um, on music. Yep. I made a playlist for Elliot called the Elliot Enhancer uh, a couple months ago, which was made solely for the purpose of educating Elliot and making him look cooler <laughs> to people. It did work. Start with SoundCloud rap, give it a bit of a definition and history. Um, this is what I'm going to hand over to you, Charlie. Yeah, through the 2010s, there was definitely a growing trend of artists just creating stuff by themselves in their rooms as like production methods got cheaper and easier and then uploading them to websites without the need for a label. It's like literally just putting their stuff on SoundCloud, which allowed anybody to put anything up on there. It just meant that there was complete creative freedom for so many new artists that didn't have very much money. That they could just put it on this platform and people would see it and people would hear it. This kind of happened because as streaming sales began to overtake actual physical record sales, record labels, decided to invest in safer bets. And so these young artists that wanted to emerge in this genre were really kind of forced to share their music through other means, like on SoundCloud. Probably one of the earliest examples, I think, of that kind of aesthetic and style is probably Odd Future, which is uh, mm. Tyler, the Creator's original entourage, which Brockhampton are often linked to. Chance the Rapper as well is another really prominent name who began with just mixtapes that were just independently done and he didn't have a label. And that, that kind of just continued to grow throughout the 2010s. Like about halfway through the decade, you saw like XXX Tentacion. The end of the decade with big names like Lil Peep, Juice World, just being like these huge figures for Gen Z. You know, kids listening to hip hop and just looking for something. I mean, mostly it lends itself to emo, but it was just a great way for you know, for kids to find new new work, really, they didn't need didn't need a big label and didn't need a big process behind it to work. And and you mentioned that the move towards emo, and that was something I sort of wanted to briefly touch on was like how the subject matter of the songs is sort of moving that way as well, more expressive, sensitive, confessional kind of lyrics. Yeah, you know, sort of My Chemical Romance. If My Chemical Romance had kind of like a hip hop aesthetic to it. Yeah. It's nostalgic but fresh at the same time, mm. which I enjoy. Yeah, the 2000s for a large part were very much what people refer to as the bling era, like the 50 cents, like ludicrous, like very sort of bombastic, like masculine. It wasn't really talking about introspective insecurities and like deep seated emotion. It was more just, it was more like hype tracks, I think was the main trend of the noughties. A big shout album, out album for influencing the way things have gone in the last 10 years, I would say is Kanye West's 808s and Heartbreaks, which came out in 2008. That was a completely radical departure from the normal sort of bling era hip hop sound. Drake rose up quite quickly after that album's release, kind of borrowing similar moods and styles from that album. You've had people like Travis Scott who've come up on a very similar sound. Also artists like The Weeknd as well. There has been a huge sort of change in the way that rap music is, like it's much more confessional in general, much more vulnerable. And then you've seen artists like, yeah, again, like Lil Peep, XX. I mean, there's other artists like Lil Zans. I mean, he's a little bit, a little bit less quality-wise, but um, there's lot, <laughs> there's lots of, there are lots of artists that use the pop punk aesthetic and use the, uh, we mix that with emo from the noughties and then have brought that into a sort of trap flavor for 2020 and for this era, which is just really interesting. The example I've got here that I found kind of fascinating, Tay K, and how he 
wrote a song about being on the run, whilst being on the run, run. he was able to upload that sort of just before he got caught, I think. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, it it doesn't get much more real than that, really, does it? Yeah, the idea of being able to record what you like and say what you like, and also a lot of these producers that are creating these tracks for artists like Juice World. There's one guy called Nick Mira, who's like 19, part of Internet Money Records, who co-founded it with uh, Taz Taylor, who's 27. Those guys are both really young. And then the artists that are using their music are also really young. So yeah, it's just very authentic. It's not necessarily sort of orchestrated by a bunch of CEOs at a label to be like, let's get the kids into this. You know, that whole X Factor kind of generation of music. I think things are much more exciting now because anyone could do anything and it doesn't need to be through the confinements of a Simon Cowell type figure telling you what, what sells and what doesn't. And I think that's really cool. And also is a um, pretty, pretty fantastic segue, Charlie. Thank you. Into, into part two of the video, changing the game. What it took to get into the music industry 20 years ago compared to now, because this is the lasting effect I think it's going to have. Anyone now can make it big. They don't need a record label. They don't need to go on X Factor. They don't need these people propping them up. They've effectively got all the ingredients to make their own success. Yeah, social media has been a huge thing. I mean, ever since social media got at all popular, it's been used to promote music. MySpace started it really. You had like Napster and stuff before that where people were sharing music. And then from there, like SoundCloud quickly came about around 2008, nine. Like there's always been a kind of association with social media and internet with music promotion because it is just such a nice authentic way of doing it. We're in a weird position today where the huge rise in TikTok over the last year or so. Oh yeah. Has really changed the way pop music's biggest hits work. Like, whereas before it was kind of like the entire song was important, like the entire construction of a good pop song or just a catchy song would help it rise up in the charts, which is still obviously the case today. But I think today it's more important to have a certain snippet of a song that can be particularly danceable, uh, memeable or quotable. Drake does it completely blatantly on his last, his last single, Tootsie Slide. But it's an all right song, it's kind of catchy, but you can tell that it's like designed to be used on TikToks. And I think that, that that is a big change for pop music and music in general, in the sense that that is what will get something super popular with Gen Z or younger, you know, younger listeners. Whereas I think 10 years ago, yeah. it was just about having a good pop chorus, like a good ascending bombastic, like, like Kate Perry's Fireworks or something like that. Like that was what would made things popular 10 years ago, because it was a big energetic. Mm. Whereas today it's, it's much more about the smaller parts of the song, the snippets that are going to be able to be shared online. So just the relationship between music and social media has always been a thing, but it's really, it's kind of morphed into this thing where they both work hand in hand today to make something popular. I kind of was comparing it to having your song as part of like a movie trailer. When the first Guardians of the Galaxy trailer came out and it had songs like Spirit in the Sky and Hooked on a Feeling, which were kind of dead songs, but their popularity soared like after the trailers came out because everyone was sort of reminded of them. And you've kind of got this now, the modern equivalent being TikTok. The biggest example I think of like a really successful TikTok song that's also just a good pop song is The Weeknd's Blinding Lights. Because there's a whole TikTok dance around it. There's a whole trend about a specific dance to that song. And it's a good song and it's The Weeknd anyway. And all those things just work in unison to just project the song up and up and up and up and up. And then, I mean, it's on like, I think it's over a billion plays on Spotify now. Another great example is um, Lil Nas X with Old Town Road last year. Produced by Young Keo, 19 year old guy. Came out and just got big on TikTok and, you know, just then became a mainstream hit. and. Came, it was made on a classic in our office. Yeah. yeah was... <laughs> how, many, how many times did we listen to it? So many like, times. Once a day for like three months. Yeah, boy. <laughs> We're using music as an example here, but it kind of filters into other areas of production and the music industry obviously filters into the music video production industry. And you've got examples like Cole Bennett and Lyrical Lemonade who started off making videos for these SoundCloud rap artists. And as their popularity grew, so did Lyrical Lemonades. And now stars like Eminem coming to them to make their music videos. Whereas before, you'd think that if you wanted a sick looking music video, you might have to be signed to like a rich ass label that's gonna pay for it. Now you can have a sick looking music video independently 
through people like Lyrical Lemonade. Yeah, like Lyrical Lemonade is a fascinating one because it's just Cole Bennett's passion project that he continued while he was at university and he dropped out of university because it was just getting so big. And I think it's just a testament to just being able to do stuff yourself today. Like you can, yeah, create your own music video production company just through a website and a video camera. All the artists involved are also self-made. So like Juice World, Lyrical Lemonade, all these other people just are just young guys just doing their thing independently. I don't know, it's a big force, it's a big movement. I think that's really cool. Yeah. One of the most recent ones is the Jack Carlo song, What's Poppin' was oh, yeah. done by Cole Bennett as well. There was a video for that. That is a sick uh, song, in a sick music video. Yeah, in a, di in a diner and it's really cool. I love um, that, I love the transitions in that where it's like, he'll go from throwing something and then like it'll cut to like that thing going in a bin and then the next shot is like up through the bin. It's very imaginative and clever and I love I love just like Cole Bennett's style. I think his music videos are successful because it's kind of going a little bit back to basics in terms of what the song's actually about and what it's saying. The focus is on that, you don't need all these big sort of flashy effects. Another um, another really good example is Kevin Abstract and Brockhampton. Their first three big records, the Saturation Trilogy, and all of those videos were directed and filmed by Kevin just in their in their house in Los Angeles. Did it all themselves on a basically no budget. And they just put them up on YouTube and they blew up and they're really big now. And again, Sugar, their song Sugar is a big one on TikTok and is really popular. And has a great, so yeah, just great music video. If a little, if a tad weird. They released a second one though, a much more normal video. Did they really? If you've seen it. You can tell they obviously were like, all right, we need a commercially viable <laughs> actual music. Like we need a second version of this video we can actually put in, you know, on telly and put on, go on MTV. advertising. <laughs> but yeah, I think they resonate with audiences now more because I, again, I don't think pop music anymore needs to be a huge production. I feel like pop music serves a different purpose than it did 10 years ago. And I think people want more authentic music and more genuine sounding things now. I just don't think that really bombastic kind of pop star anthem stadium, I just don't think that's as big of a thing anymore. I don't think people are as that bothered by that anymore. Katy Perry is such a good example. 10 years ago, Katy Perry was like the biggest pop star. Yeah. I remember Teenage Dream was like the biggest thing in the world. Every song was a smash hit on that album. Fast forward five, six years later, and Katy Perry just seems so dated. She's just never really been able to resonate again in the same way. I feel like there's a lot more there's a lot more room for celebrities to have the agency over their own relationship with their fans today. Mm. And I think it's made music more interesting because I think these pop stars feel more like more alright with being confessional, with showing themselves, whether it's in pop or trap or anything, because of the DIY, do it yourself, much more democratic kind of musical landscape. The rising trend of like mental health awareness and people talking a lot more about it, self-expression, be yourself, love yourself. That combined with the DIY generation, like obviously they've, they're the generation that's growing up with that sort of as the norm. So it, it makes sense that their art would be a lot more expressive towards that. Yeah, it's also worth saying as well, music conversation between fans is very different today than it was 15 years ago. The biggest music reviewer online, Anthony Fantano, is just an independent guy. He doesn't, he's not part of a publication, he's not part of a company. Yeah, the discourse around who's the best artist or what the best album is, all of that stuff is much more, yeah, again, DIY. Like every aspect of the music production, creation, distribution and consumption, every part of that is far more DIY today, far more independent and far more like, just I think just democratic and it adds a lot to music. It adds a lot to the industry and it makes things like really interesting and eclectic and I think that's cool. This isn't just happening in music. This is happening in other industries like fashion, film. It's been happening sort of ever since, ever since YouTube began to emerge as its own storytelling platform. Kids more likely to go online and check out what their favorite YouTubers are up to than switch on the telly and see the latest episode of whatever. I'm not a kid, obviously I'm 24, <laughs> but uh, I watch YouTube every day and I don't pay for a TV license because yeah. I don't watch telly. It's not just music, fashion, film, art. You've got people like huge Instagram accounts like Ketnips who are just putting that art out there and people are enjoying it and liking it and activism as well. People like uh, Nadia Akimoto with the period poverty movement. They've seen an issue, they want to raise awareness for it and they've gone out and done it. How a combination of social media and technology combined with the optimism and enthusiasm of Gen Z have created this whole movement about 
going out there and saying what you want to say, doing what you want to do and bringing your passions to life. What I really love about being a young person in the internet age, if I can still say that, is that there is no real mainstream culture so much mm. because people can express themselves via any avenue online and can share anything. Like things are much more widespread, much more broad and much more like pick and choose what you personally like. And I think that's really, that's really cool. Like I love that. And I think it's worth noting as well that it's not just the DIY generation in terms of people out there doing these things. It's also the DIY generation in the, in the people out there consuming it. They're making the decisions about what becomes popular now. It's like everyone's involved in shaping this movement. That seems like a good point to... I think that's everything. Yeah, I think we've got it. So Two white boys talking for an hour. Blue eyed boys drinking too much um, water. That's all I, that's all too I much, got. Too much tea for me. Oh, I could go for a tea actually. Yeah, let's wrap this up. I am spitting feathers here, Charlie. Jeez. <laughs> Thank you everyone for watching. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you want me to do an outro? Yeah, go on. So that's pretty much it guys. I think we've rounded up everything we wanted to say about the DIY generation and culture in music and then kind of a little bit in everything else as well. We're obviously just two dudes uh, talking to each other via Zoom. <laughs> so if you've, got, if you've got anything that you thought like the disagreements or things that you think we've spoken about that you've got any opinions on, like I know we'd both love to know about them. Yeah. So like just leave us a comment. Check us out on thread.com. Our new site has launched now and it looks fantastic. You can also subscribe, like, comment, everything else. And thanks for watching guys. Thank you. We'll catch you in the next one. See you guys. Bye. Ring, 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 ring. Hey, Elliot, what are we doing today? Hi, Charlie. How, how are you doing? I'm good, man. What's going on with you? I, I just wondered if you wanted to do a quick thread talk with me. That um, sounds like a, a great spontaneous thing for us to do right now. <laughs> Luckily, I'm already filming myself at my desk. I, I won't ask too many questions surrounding the context of that, but how convenient. I'm all set up here, so how about we do it? Great.